this time our children are going to be dismissed. Appreciate those that are working with our children. We got some good stuff in store for them downstairs so they can learn all about Jesus on their level. All right. Now, if you've been with us, I, I thought about preaching a whole message from the Baptist church. It's so warm up there, but I was already getting too hot by the time I got done baptizing the second one. I was like, I got to get out of here, and it's not very warm in here. I mean, not very cool in here. So uh, if I pass out up here, just look, uh, John, you just keep preaching. All right. All right. Um, if you got your Bibles, what book of the Bible we in on Sundays? We are in the book of 1 Timothy. Who's the author of 1 Timothy? God is the author. What are the man that he choose to write through? He's writing through Paul. Now, you remember that we looked at all the letters that Paul wrote while he was in prison in Rome. Just after he got released from the Roman prison, he left and he went to Ephesus. And remember, that's where the pastor of the church was, Timothy. He left Timothy there to be in charge, not just of the local church. Now, I want to remind you that the local church was not like ours. They're not, they weren't coming to a location and gathering together. They gathered in homes. And so there was multiple, maybe hundreds of home churches throughout Ephesus. And Paul had put Timothy in charge of all of them. Now, it's not at daunting of a task when you're in your probably in the mid to late 20s. But he started as being in charge of that area when he was just either 18, 19, 20 years old. He had this task. And he left Ephesus. We found out when we got to the end of chapter 1. Why? Because all the corruption going on in Ephesus, all the wickedness going on in, in Ephesus, he wanted to get out of there, so he went, goes and sees Paul. Paul gets out of jail. He's traveling with Paul back to Ephesus. And then Paul said, I left you here with a task to do, and you need to stay here and do it. And he's starting that task of, of mentioning what it is they're going to do. I was hoping today we would get into one of the most controversial scriptures in all of the Bible, but we're not going to do that today. We're going to get close to it. We're going to talk about, uh, we, we've already talked about the conduct in the church. That's what the first Timothy is all about. Telling a pastor how your folks are to be in the community as well as within the walls of the church. So conduct in the church, maturity was expected. Chapter one was all about the message of the church. That Jesus Christ came to this earth, walked on, it was filled. Our students understood what it's like to be betrayed, left alone, understood what it was like to be abandoned, and yet he laid his life down being perfect, rose from dead, conquering death, which is what we celebrate baptism with. And then we get to chapter two, which is about the members of the church. Oftentimes we don't think about what the members of the church to make up the church look like, what they're supposed to talk like, how they're supposed to dress, what they're supposed to do. And so we're going to be there. If you've got your Bibles over to 1 Timothy chapter 2, we're going to start in verse 8. But I forgot my visual aid, didn't I? Yeah, some of y'all say, what kind of visual aid? All right. What in the world do I got here? Yeah, some of them specifically, like Ed and Steve, y'all know exactly what these are for, right? These are motorcycle gloves. These are designed for a little bit warmer weather. These are designed, if you crash, to do what? Protect your hands. If it's too cold, they're designed to protect your hands. All about protecting your hands. Now, hands are very important to us. I bet you most of you got up and did stuff today, didn't even pay attention to how many times you used your hands. You know, working with teenagers for 18 years, there used to be a time that we would take them and strap their hand, one of them to their back, and, and see what they could do and how long it took to do those things. And it always takes longer because we're used to using them in tandem together. So these are to protect our hands. Now, the first church I ever used, this is a visual aid, we had over the corner a, a, a lady doing sign language. And later on, she came to me and said, her hands are her life. That is how she makes a living, is with her hands talking to people who use sign language. Hands are very important. We use them whether we realize it or not. So, gloves protect those hands. Now that you've got your Bibles open to 1 Timothy, we're going to see why it's important to talk about our hands this morning. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we do thank you. Once again, for all that you've allowed us to do today, and we thank you for the celebration of baptism. We thank you for what you're going to do in and through these young men as we as a church are faithful to pray for them. But right now, we pray that you help us to block out all distractions, all lunch plans, all desires of what we're going to do when we leave this building. Help us for the next few moments. Focus on your word. Allow your word to be the most important thing that we hear or see. And then, Lord, those who are believers here, help us to apply it to our life, to be livers, doers of your word. We ask this in Christ's name. Amen. Look with me in verse... Eight. Verse 8 of chapter 2 of First Timothy. God's writing through Paul. Paul's writing to Timothy. This is just, not just for Timothy. It's talking about the conduct of the church. The, the first few verses we talked about last week were the ingredients to prayer. Public prayer, important in corporate worship. Very important. A lot of churches have abandoned that. 
Paul is telling Timothy, don't let any of the churches meeting in the homes abandon the need to pray. It is our opportunity to talk to God and God's opportunity to talk to us. We are to talk and listen. Now, corporate prayer, a person prays on behalf of the whole congregation. If you're ever in a church and a person's praying, you need to be asking yourself, do I agree with what they're saying? Because they're representing you whether you know it or not. So you need to make sure you can say, amen, that you agree, that you agree. That's right. Yep, 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 that's right. I agree. So here, God writes through Paul saying in 8 verse 8, I desire therefore that who? Amen. All right, we're going to pick on the men because this word, when it's translated, it means male, not female at all. It is a male gender specific and it's referring to men who are leading public worship. Now remember, public worship is gathering in a home, maybe 30, but they're leading that prayer group, that worship group. So what are they to do? Now understand also that this is not restricted to just those who have a gift of God for teaching, for preaching, for evangelism. This is open to all men who want to talk to God on behalf of the congregation. So what is it like? Well, I'm glad you asked because God's going to answer that to us. And, um, as a matter of fact, public worship leaders in, in verse, uh, I mean, in, in First Corinthians chapter 11, um, let, uh, back up, back up, I'm getting ahead of myself because I want to get some good stuff real quick to cause you to really think. Look what it says. I desire therefore that men do what? Do what? Pray. You got to be loud because I got this earbud in my ear talking to the Facebook live. So you got to be loud so I can hear you. So I desire therefore that men do what? Pray. Pray. Very important. Now, this is talking about public prayer. This is the main feature of Christian worship. We talked about that last week. And, uh, but, but, but I want you to understand something. This does not limit women. See, that's the part I want to get to. See, that's the good part. Because, see, there have been churches, there have been denominations who've taken out of context what God's Word said and make it say what they want it to say. Now, God has always been a liberator of women. Don't ever forget that. I want you to understand that. that that's the truth from our scripture from the beginning to end. God has always been on women's side. So keep that in mind because, see, we have some men that live amongst us in this day and time that have the wrong mindset about women. We've already talked about that when we was in Ephesus, uh, the, the book of Ephesians, when we was in 1 Corinthians. We've talked about this in depth. You can go back on our YouTube channel and see that in depth if you want to see that. So here it says that uh, God to pray and preach in public worship service. So it says here, I desire therefore that men pray everywhere. That's in every place of worship. And how are they to pray? Look what it says. Lifting up what? Holy Some translations say men who lift up their hands in prayer must be devoted to God and pleasing to him. Now this Hebrew word there, holy, it means morally or spiritually clean. Biblical prayer must be done with a pure. And from a clean life, one devoted to the Lord. Remember, God's looking at our heart, our true motives of why we're praying. Now remember, the, the Pharisees would get on the street corners, they would make their raise their hands up, and they would make this big spectacle using these big fancy words to talk about how awesome they are, how religious they are, how they followed all of the Torah, how they kept this, how they've done that. And Jesus said they're ridiculous. They're like vipers. Because see. On the outside, they're saying one thing, but the inside, their heart was totally different. They were looking down at everyone else, thinking they were better. Jesus comes onto the scene to remind us that we're all bad. Even our best, even the best you've ever done in your life is as a filthy rag before God, only deserving to be burned up with no value. It's what you allow Christ to do through you that makes a difference. So he says, lift up holy hands. Now I want you to understand something. This is not speaking literally lifting hands up. It was what Jewish men did when they were right before God. They did lift up holy hands. It's talking about a condition of your heart. All throughout the New Testament, all since the new covenant in Christ, he's always talking about our heart, who we are, reflecting him to people and reflecting people in their worship to him. Very important role to understand. So when we get to the next few verses... If you want to take them literally, then if you pray, you better take this literally. You better stand before God, hands lifted high, and be able to say, Lord, they're pure and I'm righteous. And you talk to them. Other than that, it's, it's talking about the essence of the law. See, we have a problem, especially uh, in some situations, you know, I know some school situations where they set rules, certain rules. Those rules are to be followed the spirit of the rules. If it says not to do something, then you know don't do anything like that. 
But some people want to take it and make it say the letter of the... I'm only going to do what the letter of law said. Oh, there's a little caveat. Oh, I'm going to break the rules because there's this little caveat that says I don't have to do this. That's wrong. That's legalistic. God never called us to be legalistic. He's called us to be set free from legalism by going after Him in the spirit of what the law says, what it means. So here, He says, I therefore, uh, I desire that men pray everywhere, lifting up holy hands. And then look at the next part. Without what? Two things. Without wrath and without doubting. Without wrath, that word wrath means slow, boiling type of anger. The word doubting means to think it forward and backwards in your mind. In other words, it's an idea of an ongoing dispute. So it's saying prayer is to be offered without resentment and it is to be offered in a church representing love as you love each other and love others. In other words, it's faith without fear of what's coming from a pure heart with clean hands. Now, if you ain't got clean hands, you ain't got a pure heart, yeah, you ought to be in fear because of who you're representing. You're representing the people in corporate worship to God. And to God, uh, I mean, from God to the people, you're representing God. So you've got to have it right before you stand before God. Now, I want to tell you that some people say, oh, we don't have that. We don't have people in church get upset with each other. Yeah, we've got people on this side of church, people on that side of church, people on the other side of the overflow. They want to be separate. Not here. Praise the Lord. You know, we've been blessed. Uh, people have upset and they just leave. Praise God. But let me tell you something. When COVID hit, every church found out some tough stuff. There became big arguments, big, big disagreements. You had some on this side over here. You had some on this side over here. And they were at odds with each other. And you got the pastor and the leadership of the church right here in the middle saying, how do we handle this? How do we handle it? Argumentum. And yet they want to stand up in church and pray and act like everything's okay. Sort of like we do when we worship and we lift our hands. Oh, everything's so great. But in our heart, we're thinking about all this wickedness. Yet we saw that come out. Every church got to see it. If believers are not in good relations with each other, they should not be part of public worship. I remember as a youth pastor, I had a guy who wanted to be a drummer. A drummer's no big deal, right? This guy was good. He was talented. He was awesome. He wanted to be a drummer. And I said, okay, well, we have rules to be on stage because that's a leader in the church. Even though you're in the corner and you're right around his uh, PVC, what was that stuff called? Plexiglass. You're still a leader. And we told him he had to do X, Y, and Z. He said, I don't know how they think so. You ought to be fortunate and thankful that I even show up to play. Not one time did he ever set foot on that stage because, see, he was prideful and arrogant. He just wanted to put on a show. He wasn't living for God. He wasn't going after God. And we're not going to have that. And his mom and dad came and sat me down and want to tell me what I should do. So, you know, I had to invite the pastor. And I told the pastor, I said, look, you want them to tell me what to do and you want ungodly just on the stage, it's time for me to go because I, my, the Bible is very clear. God holds us accountable to Him and He wants us to exalt Him and He will exalt us when we're following after Him. So you can't embrace sin and put it on the stage in front of everybody. And that's exactly what this is talking about in prayer. But now look, we fix and get to something else. Look what else it says in verse uh, 9. We're going to read verse 8 and 9 together. It says, I desire therefore to men, pray everywhere, lifting up holy hands without wrath and doubting, in the like manner also. Guess what that phrase just did? It's a, a continuation of the original reference in verse uh, 8 about public leading of worship and specifically talking about prayer. Okay? Men, this is what you are to do. Women, oh, if it's talking to you. Guess what? you got to do what the men have to do. You've got to have the holy hands without wrath, without doubting. You've got to have that. But then God goes on to give you some more requirements. Isn't that sad? Let me tell you. You know why he's going to give you? I'm not going to go see what the, what the other requirements is for women. If you want to lead in public worship, if you want to be one of the ones praying, it says in like manner also in verse 9, that the women adorn themselves in what? Yeah, is it where they're modest apparel? So when men pray, they possess the, the, the sincere and holy attitudes. And women have to have the sincere and holy attitudes, but also they have to be dressed modestly. And then look at the next one. With what? Yeah, some of y'all don't know where it's at. I don't know what that word is. It means reverence and respect. It means shrinking away from what's inappropriate. It means sensible. Not only uh, pro propriety, but what else? And what? What? Moderation. That means you sound judgment. Self-control. Be appropriate. Not with what else? Braiding the hair or with what? Gold or pearls or what else? Now, some people take this part literally. 
Now, they won't stand in front of people praying, but they're not going to lift holy hands up because they're not going to have holy hands. They might have done something that morning they shouldn't have done, but they're going to do it. They're going to pretend. They're going to lie. Oh, but women, oh, no, no, no. you got to follow the letter of the law. That is not what he was saying. He was not against braided hair. He was not against costly uh, uh, outfits. He was not against these things. What he was saying is, don't dress like a prostitute that's down at the temple of Diana that people go in and sleep with in the name of their God. Don't look like her. Don't, don't dress like her. And they were specifically known to braid their hair. They were specifically known to put on this expensive makeup and wear these expensive clothes in order to worship their God. That's what they were doing. And ladies, I hate to tell you, but you got so put down in so many ways, it's just ridiculous. The men, they had a whole different standard. They could go in there and pay and sleep with them and have a great time in the name of their gods. Paul's saying, don't come to worship God like that. That's false gods. That's not real gods. When you come to worship the real God, you dress yourself with respect. You come in there modestly dressed. I'll tell you, I, I tested some teenagers out one time. That teenager got hormones going all through their body like crazy, you know. So we go to the mall and sit down, and we have these two women walk by. One woman is dressed modestly. She's looking. She's a teenager, probably 16 years old, uh, dressed nice. And the other one, you don't have to worry about what she's got on because she lets you see every part of her body like she was going to the beach. And I'm talking about in Pensacola, people go to the beach with almost nothing on. And so these guys I'm sitting with are watching them girls go by. Now, we're supposed to be there to share Jesus. And one of them said, I'm going to share Jesus with that one. I said, which one are you going to go to? The one dressed really nice or the one that's not dressed? I'm going to the one not dressed nice. Why are you going to that one? Because she looked real good. And so I asked him, is that the kind of girl you want to marry? And his response was mind-blowing, 15 years old. He said, no, I wouldn't want to marry her. Why wouldn't you want to marry her? Because she's letting everybody see what she looks like. I don't want that in a wife. I don't mind going and hanging out with her. I might get lucky. See, the guy saying he might get lucky. He said, I'll marry the one walking with her. I'm like, why would you marry her? Oh, she's got her. She respects herself. She likes herself. She's got clothes that look good. She's walking with pride. That's what I want to be my wife. 15 years old. So ladies, let me tell you something. You dress like a prostitute to be treated like a prostitute. When you come into the house of God, you should dress in a way to honor Him so that He's not embarrassed by you. There's a reason, too, we're going to get to that. <laughs> you should have so much pride in who you are because of who God is in you that you want to reflect godliness to everyone, other women as well as other men. Now, we get to verse 10. It says, But which is proper for women professing godliness is doing what? Having what? Good works. works. Alright, you got to say it. Having what? Good works. That is still not, I've got a teenage kid that can be louder than that. It's what? Good works. Good works. Now, do you know what good works is? It's works you do to honor to God that you're not trying to get a pat on the back that everybody say, oh, good job, good job, good job. When you get a pat on the back, you got your reward. Good works are what you do behind the scenes. You know, we have people in the back. They were back there getting uh, stuff ready. They were back there cleaning up that. Those are services that nobody even knows about. You know, when we baptized a couple of times ago, we had the, the, the water being poured out of the baptistry down in the basement. We had people down there mopping it up, cleaning it up. You had no idea who they were. And you said, except one, because he was the baptism candidate. We had to go find him to get him out of the cup. You get his certificate and get his handshake, you know. He was down there cleaning. See, that's godly works. Good works for the Lord. Not that you're going to get patted on the back. Now, women are to devote themselves to God and themselves should be dressed up appropriately and they should do good works for the Lord so that they reflect who they believe him to be within themselves. Now, women, why why is God picking on you and telling you to dress a certain way? Now, I'm going to tell you. Because see, men, we are so weak. You dress with a lot of cleavage, guess what? We're going to look. Even at church, you want to get a guy's mind off of God and onto you? Then dress inappropriate. And he'll get his mind on you. He'll lust after you. He will desire you. Now, if that's what you want, you want the downfall of men, then you get it. Because that's exactly what will happen. So when you walk in the church to worship God, you'll not be in a leadership position. You won't be praying publicly. You won't be leading worship if you don't dress inappropriately. Dress is very important. 
Because men's eyes are one of our weak points. We are very visually driven. And we can be worshiping God with our eyes closed, praising Him, and open our eyes and see something inappropriate, and all of a sudden, we done forgot everything we were saying. <laughs> our mind done went to another place. We done got into another world. And, and it's crazy, but that's the way we are created. And it causes us to covet you. But let me tell you something. It also causes women to covet the things you have. Now, some people, they have that desire. They, they want that. They want others to notice them. They want others to desire them. They want the, uh, others to wish they had their life. All of that takes the eyes off of God. When we come into the house of God, it should all be about focusing on Him. Vision of, of with Him in mind. The writing during this time, remember, I already talked about the temple prostitute. What was going on in Ephesus at the time? It's very important not to take Scripture out of context, but it's also important to understand what was going on at the time it was written. Well, I'm glad you asked because Paul gave us quite a bit of instruction for women to follow after. Examples of respecting herself, dressing modestly, so that she's not the object of lust, but that she reflects godliness to others. Men, you are to lift up your hands because they're holy before God. That means you're thinking clean thoughts. You got a responsibility and all of a sudden you had some bad thoughts. You better go to the Lord and ask forgiveness so you can move forward. There are a lot of uh, uh, illustrations in Scripture of godly women. One of them is Proverbs 31. You want to see what a crazy... Uh, Proverbs 31, you ought to study that sometime. Read over that. That's amazing. Christian women's beauty is found in her godly character and her love for the Lord, and it's demonstrated in all kinds of works. Now remember, this is what the church members look like. You can't hold lost people up to our standard. You can't look at them and say, oh, look at them lost people coming here all dressed like that. No, they're lost. They don't know any better. You are the members. You know better. Therefore, you hold yourself accountable. And we love them. We accept them. You know, it took some hard, hard time for some of the deacons at the church that I left down in Florida to allow these people to come in in their bathing suits to worship service. We all on the beach. It's 95 degrees. But actually, it's probably hotter than that. They would come in in their bathing suits with a cover up on them. And some of the older deacons would get very upset. I can't believe you let them girls come in there just like that. They got cover ups on. I mean, we see less than that at the beach. You're yeah, coming into the church. So we changed the rule. We put a rule in place. You're not coming in here unless you have real clothes on and a bathing suit with a cover up. It's not real clothes. Even if it looks like a dress, it's not real clothes. And you should have seen some of the people that were irate about that. Back up. There's something I want to get to right here. All right. What was going on in the, in the area was the culture. Some of you don't know about the culture, Jewish culture. What did they say? That the women were treated like a piece of property. They had zero rights. You, as a woman, you had no rights in Jewish culture. None. Your husband had all the rights. You had to do what he, pretty much what he told you to do because you were treated like a piece of property. They thought women were incapable of learning anything. Greek culture. Now, the Greek culture said that women, they have their own bedroom. And they're not allowed to talk to any man. At all, unless their husband is present. But men, they needed a courtesan, that's a female escort to go to dinners with in the public functions. They needed a mistress for sexual pleasure. They needed a wife just to bear legitimate children. That's the Greek culture. Then you got the Roman culture. And it said that the wife is only for bearing children and keeping the house. That's it. Then you got the Christian culture emerging. The Christian culture comes onto the scene, and it says that men and women are equal. What? That women can learn and that churches should give women the opportunity not just to learn, but to pray and to teach and to preach. So this verse is not prohibiting women from teaching and preaching in churches. And we're going to get to that next week. We're not going to cover that today because there's a lot in that. What else was going on in, in the uh, culture of the time? Well, women were put down at every corner. And then you got God comes along through men and says, Lift them women up. Use them women. Bless them women. Honor them women. And then Jesus comes along and he breaks down every single stereotype barrier there was. My favorite one is the woman at the well. If you've been with us on, on our movie night, we've been, we just saw that not too long ago, a couple, a couple weeks ago. We saw the woman at the well. He comes to her in noon. You probably know the story. She was not gathering water in the morning in the cool of the morning like the other women were because, well, you know, She's been married two times, and the guy she was living with was not her husband. And uh, she says she's an outcast. Nobody's going to talk to her. And the crazy thing is, Jesus is walking with his disciples, and they go through Samaria. Now, the Jews hated the Samaritans. You know why? They were considered half-breeds. 
They were had a, a, one parent being a, a Greek and one parent being Jew, and they didn't like it. They hated it. It was racial. They hated it all. They, would, they hated them so bad that they wouldn't even step foot on their property. They would go all the way around, extra days traveling to get to the other part because they didn't want to go through Samaria. Jesus said, we're going through Samaria. The, 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 the disciples challenged him. But they went. Then they talked about being hungry. He said, you go in and get you some food. I got business to take care of. They go in and get food. They come back. He's talking to a woman. And when he asked the woman for a drink of water, she's puzzled. Wait a minute. You a Jew talking to a female. A male talking to a, a female. You a Jew talking to a Samaritan. What's going on with you? Are you kidding me? You don't even have nothing to draw water with. And then he goes on to talk about him being living water. She'll never have to draw water ever again. And when she understands what he's talking about, eternal life, that he is the eternal life, she goes in and tells everyone who he is. And the Samaritans welcome and embrace these Jews and refer to Jesus as the Christ. He is the coming one, the Messiah. He reveals himself to them first. The arch enemy of the Jews. But see, that's what Jesus always does. Breaks down every barrier that us men and women put up. He breaks them down. So he broke down the barrier of race. He broke down the barrier of, of sexism. And she went out and was his missionary spokesperson. And then we see Jesus over and over and over encouraging women. Then we see the disciples come onto the scene. They didn't change anything. As a matter of fact, Paul, we're going to see next week, he lifted up a lot of women. He had a lot of women going with him. You know, he wasn't married, and we talked about how ugly he was, we talked about how short he was, we talked about how stocky he was, we talked about how he was balding in his head. He didn't have no wife, but he had a lot of women that went with him to do work of the ministry because they were godly women who loved the Lord, who wanted to be a blessing, not just to the Lord, but to Paul. Because he had the power in the words that he spoke. Even though he was a self-proclaimed, non-speaking person, he was not very eloquent. God used him anyway. So you have no excuse to say, I can't be used by God. This passage that we see in verse 8 and verse 9, it's talking about corporate worship. It's all He already set the program in, in the first few verses of, of chapter 2 of what prayer is about, what makes up prayer. Then he goes into saying, men, when you pray, you need to have a clean heart. You need to come with pure hands. They need to be undefiled. You, women, need to come with the same attitude. And you need to be addressed appropriate. And then you give glory to God publicly. What's the most attractive thing a lost person can see? Is a believer in love with Jesus. Is a believer going after Jesus with every part of their life. A believer who does not say, I got this, Lord, you stay away from me. I got, I got this one little closet that I got to keep because that's my stuff. That's my dirty stuff right there. No! It's when you give every part of every part of your life over to him say, Lord, I am transparent as I can be because I want to love you and I want to love everyone else. That's all he's called us to do, right? Is to do those two things. To do what? Love, God. love him. And to do what else? Love others. See, you can't love him if you don't know him. You can know about God. You can read the Bible and find all kinds of things about God. You can go online and read a lot about the president and know a lot about the president, but you don't know the president. <laughs> he doesn't want you to know about him. He wants you to know him. Knowing him means that you strip yourself away from who you are. Now, the Bible is very clear. We've been going through... Since we got the last week, the Roman road, you remember what it says in Romans chapter 1, verse 16? God says that you should not, because Paul was not, ashamed of the gospel of Christ, because it is the power of God unto salvation. Then we go on to chapter 3, verse 23, and it says that all have what? Sin. All have sinned. Every single person born into this world has sinned and comes short of the glory of God. But we get to chapter 6, verse 23, it says the gift of God is what? Eternal life through who? Only one way. God made it as simple as possible so we could not confuse it. And we, we do a good job trying to confuse it. One way. Inviting Jesus into our heart. What does that look like? What is A, B, C, salvation? Well, we know. Admit we're a sinner. Believe in the Jesus, the Son of God, came to Israel, died on the cross, rose again, and then see, confess with our mouth what we believe in our heart. You're a sinner. I'm a sinner. We're sinners condemned and clean. But the gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus. What do you have to do? Well, you have to confess with your mouth. That you believe in your heart. And then you will be saved. There's no fancy formula. There's no fancy words. God's looking at what? He's looking at your heart. He's looking at you. He created you in His image with the ability to think, reason, and choose. Because He wanted you to choose to follow Him. You know, me and Brandon, we ride motorcycles all the time together. And, 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 and it's always surprising how many people want to ride with no protection. No protection. 
You want to get out there and ride with short? I understand I come from Florida where it's hot. I've seen guys riding motorcycles, these race bikes that go 200 miles an hour with shorts on and flip flops. I'll never forget a conversation I had with a guy. He pulls up beside me. I'm in full gear. 101 degrees. I'm full gear, sweating to death. He drives up. He's got a helmet on, a pair of shorts and flip flops. So I kind of laughing at him. I said, what do you got a helmet on for, man? He said, well, if I crash, I want to, I want to survive the crash. I said, no, you really don't. You really have no idea. You do not want to survive that crash. I got an uncle that survived a, a slow crash with a little bit on it. Lost all his skin. Took a long, took a, a couple of days off of work. Couldn't hardly move. You do not want to survive that. You might as well take that helmet off. There's no, there's no helmet on in Florida. Just ride without it. So when you crash, because see, folks, riding a motorcycle ain't about if you crash. It's when you crash, because if you ride, you're going to crash. It's either going to be your fault or somebody else's fault. You're going to, you're going to do that. It's, it's, it's not that it's dangerous. It ain't no more dangerous to ride in a car. People get in a car wrecks all the time and dying left and right. <laughs> but making a choice not to wear protection is about as stupid as you can be because you are created in God's image. He gave you the ability to think reason you. He gave us the desire to create these things so that when we crash, we can survive it. And I don't know, I just am very cautious. I, will, I don't want to inflict pain upon myself. I want to survive it to where I can walk away unhurt. Some of you might like getting hurt. I don't know. That's okay. You can do that. Go out there and don't wear anything but a helmet. That's fine. Pennsylvania, you've got no helmet off. And, and I know, I get you sending me emails all the time. You see them idiots riding with no helmets on? I'm like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Because they know if they crash, they're going to die. I mean, you, you can fall over on a bicycle. And die with a brain injury. That's why we make our kids under 16 years age wear a helmet. Because statistics have shown our minds are so fragile, our brain is so fragile that it can burst open. But our bodies are pretty fragile. Some of you are getting older. You complain about all the aches and pains. You complain about things you can't do because you used to do it, but you can't do it. Because your body is wearing out. It's the way it was designed. But those who know Jesus, we give them glorified bodies. When we get a glorified body, I don't know what that's going to tell, but uh, uh, apparently it's going to be pretty cool because Jesus just appeared. Jesus just was it with the guys walking down the road, and all of a sudden he disappeared. I'm like, hey, I want to be able to do that. That sounds pretty cool. I want to be able to think I fall and go there. You know, I love that idea of transport. I give up motorcycle riding to fly, or even better, to just close my eyes and all of a sudden I'm where I want to be. <laughs> Whatever that glorified body is going to look like is going to be amazing. But you don't get it automatically. The Bible is very clear. The body you have is going to wear out and you will get another body and you will be eternally separated from God forever. We call that eternal death. Or you'll be united with God forever and ever. And we call that eternal life. And guess what? He loves you so much, He gives you the choice to make it yourself. He's not going to force you. He's not going to send you to heaven or hell. He's going to let you choose. He made you with the ability to think, reason, and choose. He says, here, I've even given you a lot of words in the Bible to tell you what life is going to be like. I've even told you what eternal death is going to be like. Pain and suffering, torment, blackness, darkness, no light. You ain't going to see no friends there, so don't come to me and say, hey, my friend's going to be there at a party. No, it ain't going to be the party. You're going to be a party of one. By yourself, isolating alone. And it's going to be pitch black because there is no light there. And it's going to be a place where you're going to squeeze your teeth together so hard, wishing the pain would stop. But it ain't going to stop. But it's your choice, honey. It's your choice. Today is the day you can change all of that for eternity. If you bow your head and close your eyes, ask yourself that question. Has there ever been a time you invited Jesus into your heart? Now, I ain't talking about going forward in the church, saying some prayer, and being bad. I'm talking about have you really genuinely invited Jesus into your heart, turned over every area of your life, and desire to live for Him? It's about a lifestyle, a relationship, not religious responsibility and duties. Loving Him. If you love Him, you say, oh, Pastor King, I love Jesus. Well, did you spend any time reading His Word, His love letter to you this week? Did you spend any time uh, praying to Him this week? Did you spend any time with other believers encouraging one another? If the answer is no, then you don't love Him. You might not even, probably don't even know Him. You've got to know Him before you can love Him. And you cannot love others in a godly way until you're loving God in a godly way. That's Him loving through you to others. It begins with you walking with Him. If you're here today and you never invited Jesus in your heart, we're going to have an invitation. We're going to invite you to come forward, take me by the hand. Say, I really cannot invite Jesus in my heart. I've never, I've never turned my life over to Him. I, I want to be born again, blood washed, spirit back. Because I want to become a new creation in Christ. I want all old things to pass away and everything to start over and become new today. We can introduce you to my bestest friend. 
You may be here and say, oh, brother, can I invite Jesus in my heart? I've not been baptized by immersion, and I would like to do that. You come forward, take me by the hand. We'll pray about that. We'll get that taken care of as well. You may be here looking for a church home. Someplace you can drop your guard and just be real. Just be who you are. God leads you to be with us. We'll love to have you. Father, we just pray that you speak to our hearts. You challenge us where we need to be challenged. You convict us of those things we need to be convicted of. That we'll love you and love others. Father, I pray that you'd speak to our hearts now. If you're desiring any of us to make a, 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 a commitment today, that you'd help us to come forward. Kneel at the altar, take me by hand, and pray. We thank you for loving us and believing in us. For we do ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Standing as we sing.